Hello, and welcome to the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation's Meet the Scientist monthly webinar series. I'm Dr. Jeff Borenstein, BBRF's President and CEO. Today, Dr. Shelley Buffington will present Therapeutic Targeting of the Microbiome for Neurodevelopmental Disorders. BBRF is the world's largest private funder of mental health research grants supporting transformative discoveries in order to develop improved treatments, cures, and methods of prevention. The high quality of the research we fund is made possible by the BBRF Scientific Council. This group of over 180 prominent mental health researchers reviews each grant application and selects the most promising ideas with the greatest potential to lead to breakthroughs. The Scientific Council guides the foundation to fund creative and impactful basic, translational, and clinical research relevant to the whole spectrum of mental health. One reason that research funded by BBRF has such a great impact is because we do not limit ourselves to one illness or condition. Since 1987, the foundation has awarded more than $440 million to fund more than 6,400 research grants around the world. The, the uh, spectrum of brain illnesses that are um, researched include addiction, ADHD, anxiety, autism, bipolar disorder, borderline personality disorder, depression, eating disorders, obsessive compulsive disorder, post-traumatic stress, schizophrenia, as well as suicide prevention. Today, I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Shelley Buffington. Dr. Buffington is Assistant Professor in the Department of Neuroscience, Cell Biology, and Anatomy at the University of Texas. She was a 2019 Young Investigator. Our webinar will begin with Dr. Buffington's presentation, which will then be followed by a Q&A. To submit your questions, please use the questions tab on the control panel on your screen. Please feel free to submit your questions at any time during the presentation. Following the presentation, I'll ask as many as time will allow. Now, I'm, in, I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Buffington. Shelley, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jeff, and thank you so much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you. Thank you for taking time to hear about the research that we've got going in, on in the lab. So really what I'm gonna tell you about today is how we, we think of the gut microbiome as a mediator of these gene environment interactions that modulate neurodevelopment and behavior. And um, just to start out, I really want to emphasize how grateful I am for the early career funding that I did receive um, from the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation. And actually that NARSAI grant made it possible to hire both uh, Dr. Claudia Diesu and Dr. Lisa Matz, who are integral um, to the story that I'm going to be telling you today. So thank you very much. I specifically want to uh, thank Jack and Kelly Scott of the Scott Gentle Foundation. Um, and and uh, Jack and Kelly, of course, are also fellow Texans and they're out in West Texas. And speaking of West Texas, uh, that's actually where our strong uh, cattle industry is located in Texas. And I was listening to this interesting um, NPR interview recently with uh, Darren Turley, who of course is the president of the Texas Cattlemen's Association. And actually it's a banner year in Texas because we're not number four anymore, we're number three in dairy production in the US. We've actually surpassed Idaho and that's and that's fascinating. And, and Darren Turley was being interviewed asking about what are the effects of you know recent drought, right, on the cattle industry? And and specifically, what about, how does this change the you know cattle industry, you know, what's being given to the cows for their diet? He's like, oh, no, 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 no. We've got their diet down to a science. We've got their diet down to the level of amino acids, right? And, and what I hope to emphasize here is that some you know, cattle are actually being fed better than many of us. And what I, I think that these cattlemen appreciate is how important diet is and how important diet can be to altering the mic gut microbiome and how this affects overall health and physiology. And what I'd like to show you today is that it's really important also for mental health outcomes. 
over the last uh, seven years, wow, well, uh, I've been really interested in studying how a maternal uh, diet affects neurodevelopmental outcomes in subsequent generations. And so we know that in the US, approximately three in 10 children are actually born now to women with pre-pregnancy obesity. Um, rates of obesity are rising in the world, not just in the US, but globally, as you can see in this change from the 1980s to the uh, 2015. And we consider this a mental health challenge. And that's because the growing, um, it, because maternal pre-pregnancy obesity does uh, affect risk for neurodevelopmental disorders, including autism spectrum disorder. It, it changes that odds ratio. Now, of course, autism is highly heritable. We know that there are many genes that are contributing to this disease. However, there's this growing body of evidence that gene environment interactions do contribute to neurodevelopmental pathology and they associate maladaptive behaviors in some cases. So what we, can show, we see here is a, a really nice graphic from a Nature Medicine review from Dan Geshwin's lab a few years ago. And what it shows is there's several types of genes, including we've got you know synaptic genes as well as scaffolding genes like Incrin 2, Inc B here, and even genes that are involved in chromatin remodeling. Of course, we've got our syndromic um, autism spectrum disorders with fragile X being the most commonly inherited form of intellectual disability. However, altogether, what we know about the genetics underlying ASD represents only a small fraction of cases, and there's this very large unaccounted uh, liability that we think um, it, there's increasingly emerging evidence that there are in critical environmental factors. And the environmental factors that we are studying in the lab all revolve around the maternal experience. Maternal exposures kind of throughout the female lifespan, but specifically during pregnancy, um, including ma how maternal nutrition affects neurodevelopment and neurodevelopmental outcomes in children, maternal infection during pregnancy, prior to pregnancy, and uh, we hope to get into toxin exposure. And so we do have funding in the lab right now for looking at maternal nutrition as well as uh, maternal infection with live infectious agents. So that's ongoing work in the lab. But what I'm gonna primarily focus on today are the effects of maternal nutrition, specifically maternal overnutrition around the time of conception and through uh, gestation and lactation on offspring outcomes and specifically in a mouse model uh, for maternal pre-pregnancy obesity. So I'm gonna take you back to my postdoctoral work that we published in Cell in 2016. And we wanted to model this phenomenon where we've got you know, maternal pre-pregnancy obesity leading to adverse neurodevelopmental health outcomes. And so the way that we did this was we fed uh, female mice, either a regular, so that's gonna be represented by RD throughout the talk, or a high fat diet, HFD in red here, um, for eight weeks prior to mating. The subject offspring were born roughly three weeks later, though we did see a little bit of spontaneous abortion in our high-fat diet-fed dams um, that did delay uh, delivery in them a little bit. But regardless, and this is a very important point, regardless of the maternal diet, all of the offspring were fed a regular diet upon weaning. So that means the only exposure to high-fat diet was during gestation and lactation. Approximately four weeks later, we assayed offspring behavior in multiple tests um, for social behavior, anxiety-like behavior, et cetera, um, when they were juveniles. And all of the data that I'm gonna show you from this 2016 paper is in male mice, and this will become especially relevant when we uh, discuss our most recent work. So what you can see here is this, this is a test for social behavior I'm sure many of you are familiar with. It's called reciprocal social interaction. This is where two mice from different cages, so they don't know each other, they're strangers. They're put into this neutral arena and allowed to interact for 10 minutes. And we measure the amount of time um, that they spend interacting with each other. And what you can see here is there's a significant reduction in the amount of time that two mice from our maternal high fat diet cohort spend interacting. They actually much prefer to kind of cug opposite corners of the cage and just explore uh, the arena uh, as opposed to interaction. And really this was uh, representative of kind of a compromised contact ratio. So low quality interactions, very brief, not a long time spent snipping each other. Of course, we run redundant um, tests for social behavior in the lab. This is another very common test for social behavior called three chamber test. Test. And what you see here, this is um, a three-stage three test. Each one's 10 minutes long, and they happen immediately upon uh, after each other. In this first phase of habituation, we can study locomotor activity, willingness to explore uh, this new apparatus, and that's called habituation. In the second phase, we look at, you know, does our subject mouse here uh, prefer interacting with a mouse that's in this wire cup or an empty cup, so an inanimate object? 
uh, and, and what you can see here when we look at the sociability data from our neurotypical mice here in the blue, we see a strong preference, and this is just one track bot for a single animal. But you can see a clear preference develop, and this is quantified here for our group of animals, um, for the mouse over the empty cup. However, that's lacking in our maternal high-fat diet mice. And similarly, when we do a test for social novelty, so we leave mouse one where he is, introduce a novel mouse two from a separate cage of strangers, and now we've got in the neurotypical mice a preference for the social novelty versus this old familiar boring stranger. Again, just like what we saw in the sociability, we've got deficits and preference for social novelty in the three-chamber test. So our, our, this social deficit, um, we see consistent between results in the three-chamber test as well as reciprocal social interaction. And about the time that we had this data in our maternal high-fat diet model, there's this beautiful paper out, out of Elaine Chow's, uh, uh, that was basically first author Elaine Chow out of Sarkis Mansmanian's lab, showing that these microbiota modulate behavioral and physiological abnormalities associated with neurodevelopmental disorders, and they were specifically using the maternal immune activation model uh, for autism, and what they were doing is they performed 16S, ribosomal RNA gene amplicon sequencing, which lets us um, see a, a genus level resolution for which microbiota, which taxa are present. And they saw a clear dysbiosis or a, a disruption of this microbial community um, in their maternal immune activation mice. And this was quite fascinating to us because we knew from the work from Jeff Gordon's lab, Peter Turnbaugh, and others that focus on how diet can alter the gut microbiome, that you know, diet is even more important than genetics in shaping you know, this microbial community. And so we hypothesized that the high fat diet being fed to our female mice could actually affect the, you know, the gut microbiome composition of their offspring in the F1 generation. And so we, we dove in and we did 16S ribosomal RNA gene amplicon sequencing ourselves. And what you see here is a principal coordinates analysis. And each one of these dots represents a different mouse uh, in the respective cohort uh, colored here. Again, just our neurotypical mice in blue and our maternal high fat diet mice in red. And what you can clearly see is that there's this, the distribution is, is completely dependent on maternal diet exposure. And importantly, actually, these mice were about six months old. So that means they have been winged five months prior to when we were analyzing the contents of their gut microbiome. So this is an enduring dysbiosis or disruption of the gut microbiome in these maternal high-fat diet animals, even though they've been receiving a regular diet since the time of weaning. And so we were really interested in understanding, I guess, so in, in, on, on the right here, what you can see is that we've got these uh, reduction in overall diversity of the gut microbiome of these animals. So we saw an overall loss in species. And of course, importantly, you know, it's not that they're all, all lost. Some of these species maybe in the top here weren't present in the MRD mice or they were present at a low abundance. And we actually saw blooming of some, some species in this case. So it was really, really interesting. And so what we decided to do is we took uh, advantage of the fact that mice are coprophagic. And what that means is they actually will consume the fecal pellets that are on the bottom of the cage. And this is an effective means of microbiome transfer um, between co-housed individuals. And so we did a co-housing experiment where we um, co-housed animals at either a three to one or even a one to three ratio of neurotypical to maternal high fat diet offering. And what you can see here is we see, saw a shift away from the maternal high-fat diet, diet gut microbiome composition toward a more normal, more neurotypical gut composition. That, um, and, and so we saw recovery of this loss of diversity here. And that correlated with um, a, a rescue of behavior in multiple and reciprocal social as well as uh, this three-chamber test. And so we wanted to really understand what was the causal relationship um, in data that I don't show here. We actually did some fecal microbiota transplants into germ-free mice and showed that a fe fecal microbiota transplant from a donor that was in this neurotypical group could rescue baseline social deficits in the germ-free mice, which, which do have social deficits to begin with, but you can rescue those with a fecal microbiota transplant. Um, which is basically a fecal slurry that you give um, to the mice, and but that our maternal high-fat diet fecal slurry did not rescue those social deficits in the germ-free mice. And so we thought that something, together with this data from the co-housing, this led us to the idea that something important for social behavior was missing 
from the gut microbiome of these maternal high-fat diet mice. And so we decided to go back um, to the microbiome and do whole genome metagenomic shotgun sequencing. And so that allowed us to get beyond uh, the level of genus down to the not only species, but even strain specificity. And what we found, what our top hit was as far as what was missing, what was downregulated in that maternal high-fat diet gut microbiome uh, was lactobacillus reutery. It's recently been reclassified as Lamassi lactobacillus reutery, um, but this was really quite fascinating. And, and we wondered um, whether just reconstituting the gut microbiome of these maternal high-fat diet offspring with L. reutery, would that have any impact um, on the outcome uh, in their social behavior tests. And so L. reutery is actually a facultative anaerobe. What that means is it can um, survive in the absence or even you know, the presence of oxygen. So we were actually able to deliver the L. reutery here in the animal's drinking water. So we just swapped it out every day, uh, the normal drinking water, and we were able to deliver the probiotics that way. The L. reutery survived this. We only lost about an order of magnitude um, of, an of the bacteria each day. So these, uh, so we're doing these probiotic treatment in our maternal high-fat diet mice, and it was initiated at the time of weaning, and we, it persisted through the time that we were doing our behavioral analyses. All right, and so remarkably, uh, we found that Lactobacillus reutery was able to rescue the social deficit phenotype that we observed in our maternal high-fat diet mice. And then it wasn't just any lactobacillus species because lactobacillus johnsoni, which was actually also downregulated, albeit at a different magnitude in our maternal high-fat diet mice, um, didn't do it. So there's something special what that L. reutery was able to do um, to affect the behavioral outcomes of these maternal high-fat diet mice. And what's really interesting about L. reutery when we dived into the literature, because we didn't know anything about it um, when we got these whole genome sequencing results, um, there was a report from Susan Erdman's lab at MIT showing that lactobacillus reutery could speed up the wound healing process following a, basically a wound biopsy. Um, but this was done in an, an oxytocin-dependent way. So that, that's, that speeding up of wound healing did not happen in oxytocin knockouts. And of course, we know from uh, Larry Young's group and, and many others uh, that oxytocin is a critical uh, social bonding hormone um, that contributes uh, to normal, uh, even affiliative interaction between two mammals. And so we really wanted to know what was the baseline maternal high-fat diet oxytocin levels? Is this something that could be affected in our maternal high-fat diet offspring? I said, and if L. reutery is working through oxytocin uh, nergic system to expedite wound healing, could that also be, uh, could we be tapping into this mechanism for the rescue of social behavior? So in the brain, uh, oxytocin is generated in two hypothalamic nuclei. One of these is shown here. This is the paraventricular nucleus. Um, it has a lot of central projections uh, onto other areas and it, and, it, and it drives, it sends out oxytocin onto this dopaminergic reward system that's really thought of as this like social reward system where these dopamine gets output to the nucleus accumbens, which is critically controlling decisions behind social behavior. And when we looked in the brains, we saw a reduction in these oxytocinergic, number of oxytocinergic cells in these, the paraventricular nucleus that was in rescue with l rotary. And this rescue, and this mechanism, the circuit uh, is, is com uh, evolutionarily conserved between rodents and, and humans. And we knew, know from uh, work out of Carl Dysross lab and uh, Rob Malenka that Stimulation of the VTA uh, is critical uh, for normal social behavior when they express these light sensitive channels and specifically in these VTA dopaminergic neurons, they can drive an increase in social interaction and that same that reciprocal social interaction task. If they were to block the activity of these neurons with continuous optical inhibition delivered by uh, halo rhodopsin, that actually reduces interest in social interaction. This is specific to social interaction because it, neither of these uh, modulations alters the time that an animal spends in interaction with an inanimate object. And so we wondered, just like you know, hippocampal long-term physiology in, in CA1 neurons is kind of a physiological correlate of memory, could there be some sort of physiological correlate of social uh, behavior? And so we actually redesigned our reciprocal social interaction task. And now not only do we have these stranger interactions where these mice are coming from two different cages, right? The gray versus the green tail cage. Now we also incorporated another version of this test where it's just two, two mice from the same cage that are now put into this neutral arena and allowed to explore. 
And what we did was we not only measured the interaction time that they spent, and so basically when the mouse is put in the, in the arena with a familiar animal, they spend a lot less time interacting and more time exploring the box. Not, uh, not surprising. However, when there's a stranger, there's a lot more one-on-one -on -one interaction that happens in our maternal regular diet group. And so this is only a 10 minute interaction, but when we isolate the brains of these animals 24 hours later, what we can see is a change in the, um, in the currents coming through different uh, glutamate receptors. There's a change in the response to an input uh, in these VTA dopaminergic neurons that you can see here. There's a significant increase on par with what you would see from an addictive dose of cocaine in these animals. However, in our maternal high fat diet mice, we see very little increase in the total interaction time uh, during this reciprocal social interaction action test, and we see no change in this long-term, there's no long-term synaptoplasticity in these VTA dopaminergic neurons. So the way that we interpret these, this is that the mice cannot perceive, the maternal high-fat diet mice do not perceive social interaction as rewarding. Uh, so it's actually completely logical that they would not pursue uh, social interaction in this case. However, upon therapeutic modulation of the gut microbiome with l rotary in our maternal high-fat diet males, what we found is that this actually restored the social interaction due to synaptoplasticity in our maternal high-fat diet animals. And so that was really exciting, and that was kind of the crux of this first paper, but it left us, as many of the best scientific investigations do, with several open questions. And so one of these was, can l rotary also rescue autism-like phenotypes in genetic or even idiopathic models of autism? We've begun to get um, to that through a couple of recently published papers. And finally, of course, what is the mechanism um, by which it's working? And again, I, th I think we've added to that substantially in the, in the last uh, three or four years. All right. So one of the first papers, this neuron paper from 2019, we asked, could this work in a genetic model for autism? And so uh, one of the best well-established um, models for autism is Schenck, the Shank 3 b knockouts. And what we did, just like with our maternal high-fat diet mice, we actually introduced l rotary into the water, the drinking water of these animals and performed behavioral assays at uh, seven weeks. And so what you can see here is, um, and I don't have the legend up yet, sorry. So we've got deficits in social interaction, uh, sociability in the three-chamber tests in our Shank 3 b knockouts consistent with the literature. Um, however, upon treatment with l rotary, we saw a really beautiful rescue of that social deficit phenotype. And not only did we see that in the three-chamber test, we also saw a rescue of uh, reciprocal social interaction phenotypes. Another question that we had was whether, just like in our maternal high-fat diet mice, would we see these deficits in social interaction due to synaptic plasticity, um, the responsiveness, how, how social interaction changes, you know, VTA uh, uh, activity um, at that 24-hour time point uh, in the Shank 3B mice, or is that a phenomenon restricted to our maternal high-fat diet offspring? And so again, we went and we recorded from VTA dopaminergic neurons, and what we found is, yes, we see this plasticity in our control animals following social interaction with a novel stranger uh, 24 hours later. But just like in our maternal high-fat diet mice, um, there, there was this deficit in social interaction induced snack to plasticity in the Shank 3B knockouts that was rescued uh, by l rotary. Furthermore, we asked whether we could it exogenously introduce oxytocin. So, so we think that l rotary at this point, we were thinking l rotary is working through the oxytocinergic system. So the question was, can we bypass this gut-brain connection uh, by just introducing oxytocin intranasally? And so uh, as many of you know, you know there are um, attempts being made at intranasal oxytocin treatment uh, to increase social sociability and, and social you know, dysfunction disorders. And so we, we did that, and what we found is, yes, indeed, that the, if you administer oxytocin 30 minutes prior to this social interaction uh, in the reciprocal social test, that we could rescue social interaction due to synapse plasticity and, sort of, of course, our positive control with cocaine, we do see um, this VTA, uh, dopaminergic synapse plasticity, established. So one of the next questions that we had was, 
the, you know, the gut microbiome and, and brain connection is mediated by multiple channels, uh, including connection via the vagus nerve, which is shown here, uh, as well as microbial metabolites and even modulation of the immune system. So we tried to tackle this um, and we isolated them. And we our first question was, could we basically sever this connection between the gut and the brain that's mediated by the vagus nerve? And so we collaborated with neurosurgeon Eric Momin of Baylor College of Medicine and perform subdiaphragmatic. So under the diaphragm, we cut the vagus nerve um, and we validated it, that it was complete uh, based on satiety tests. And then we asked whether L. Reutery could still rescue uh, the social deficits in the Shank 3B knockouts. And what we saw is in the vagotomized shank 3b knockouts that do not have vagal mediated communication from the gut to the brain that l rotary was no longer able to rescue the deficits that we saw however intranasal oxytocin was right so that circuit was intact right within the brain but the communication between the gut and the brain that was resulting in improved sociability uh, which just simply was not there and we saw this both in the three chamber test as well as in reciprocal social interaction so the next question we wanted to ask was, uh, what's the role of these dopaminergic neurons and, and specifically oxytocin? So we took a genetic approach and we specifically deleted oxytocin receptors. So um, the, the channels that oxytocin binds to, uh, to drive activity in these dopaminergic neurons. And so in our dopaminergic uh, uh, neuron-specific oxytocin receptor knockouts, we saw a reduction in total interaction time. We shot, saw impaired um, AMPA to NMDA ratios uh, following a social interaction in those animals. And l reutery the, the l reutery uh, uh rescue was attenuated um, when we deleted oxytocin receptors specifically in dopaminergic neurons, and oxytocin, intranasal oxytocin, was also no longer um, able to drive this increased uh, in social interaction, right, because we're cutting off um, how oxytocin is contributing to dopaminergic activity, right? Without oxytocin receptors, there, there's going to be no response to oxytocin. Um, so actually, so here, um, I'm going to take you back in time a little bit. Uh, so I was just telling you about our experiments and our Shank 3B knockouts. But one of the first mice that I was interested in working with um, to see if l Reutery could, it, whether it was a one-trick pony or not, um, could it work in another model, were the catnip 2 knockouts. And why is this? Well, Dan Geschwin's lab has done a lot of great work uh, with these catnip 2 knockouts. They've got core autism-like phenotypes, including communication deficits, social dysfunction, increased repetitive behavior. And he and his group uh, had shown that FDA approved risperidone does rescue communication in these animals as, as well as stereotypy, but specifically it didn't address the social deficits in the animals. In 2015, they had a beautiful follow-up paper in Science Translational Medicine showing that both endogenous as well as exogenously evoked oxytocin does rescue catnap to knock out social dysfunction. So essentially, there's a critical role for you know, oxytocin dysregulation in these catnap 2 knockouts in their social phenotypes, but it doesn't resolve the hyperactivity phenotype. And finally, what we've got um, most recently, they published about the aberrant functional connectivity in the brains of these animals, and that endogenous oxytocin released from the paraventricular ventricular nucleus of the hypothalamus onto the nucleus of Cummins does rescue social dysfunction. So I was really interested in using this mice and these mice and specifically in, in part of the story I don't have time to go into. We found that it's the mouse genetics that's driving the hyperactivity phenotype, but really microbial genetics, the microbiome that's driving the social dysfunction in these animals. And so Essentially, uh, we, we repeated these experiments where we treated the animals with l reutery upon weaning, uh, switching out the water every day, and then performing behavioral analyses. Just like in the Shank 3B knockouts, we did indeed see these in the Catnap 2 knockout line. Uh, we saw deficits in social behavior that were rescued upon treatment with lactobacillus reutery. And just like with oxytocin, which was shown to be effective in, in modulating the catnap 2 knockout social deficits, um, but having no effect on the hyperactivity phenotype, l reutery didn't touch the hyperactivity phenotype in these catnap 2 knockouts. So we next, we went back and looked at uh, what about social interaction induced synaptic plasticity in VTA dopaminergic neurons, and we did patch clamp recordings, whole cell physiology. And just like uh, in the Shank 3B knockouts and the maternal high-fat diet mice, we've got this uh, 
Social interaction due to plasticity deficits in our knockout animals, catnap 2 knockouts, and can be rescued um, by a loitery treatment. And so this was really quite intriguing to us. How is this working? And so we actually pursued an alternative um, communication channel between the gut and the brain here and performed fecal metabolomics to look at the differences, uh, potential differences in metabolites uh, that were present in the fecal specimens uh, from our mice. And so we did this. We performed a random uh, forest analysis uh, on some really nice metabolomics data that we partnered with Metabolone on. And we actually found a really interesting about 20-fold loss of two metabolites in the tetrahydrobiopterin pathway. And so this is biopterin and dihydrobiopterin. Now, tetrahydrobiopterin is critical for monoamine synthesis. It's a critical cofactor, and so including uh, for dopamine. So this was really intriguing to us. And we next wondered, well, if, if that tetrahydrobiopterin loss uh, is, is critical to the social phenotypes we're seeing in these catnap 2 mice, can we actually just introduce BH4 or tetrahydrobiopterin itself and rescue the phenotypes that we see? And so indeed, uh, just very briefly, we saw improved uh, interaction time between uh, tetrahydrobiopterin treated uh, catnap 2 knockouts versus the control treated animals, as well as rescue of social interaction induced synaptic plasticity. And furthermore, just like oxytocin, just like L. Reutery, tetrahydrobiopterin had no effect on the hyperactivity phenotype in our catnap 2 knockouts. All right, so moving on, we, again, we've got these remaining fascinating questions. So, so and I think I've, I've hopefully been leading it you guys to this in the, in the way that I've been speaking about, okay, we, our l rotary worked in our maternal high-fat diet mice. It worked in the shank 3B mice. It worked in the catnap 2 mice. And so this got me to wondering, so given that l rotary rescues social dysfunction in multiple mouse models for autism, are we really actually back to square one in our goal to understand how maternal high-fat diet leads to these adverse neurodevelopmental and behavioral outcomes in offspring? And we actually, I think we really began to get at this uh, in a, a Cell Reports paper uh, that we published in October. And then finally, again, so I, I, we really hadn't gotten to the full mechanism by which l rescues social dysfunction in mouse models for autism. All right, so here's the story that I first opened up this talk with. So we've got a high-fat diet that's being fed to a female mice. We've got this vertical transmission of a dysbiotic gut microbiome, so a disrupted gut microbiome ecology that is transferred from mom to son, right? However, there's been a lot of really interesting findings published as of late. One of these is from Elaine Chow's lab pointing the, to the importance of the maternal gut microbiome in early life neurodevelopment. And so this paper from Elaine's group, they show that the maternal gut microbiome does contribute to fetal neurodevelopment in mice and dysbiosis is associated with dysfunction. And specifically what they were looking at is if you've got germ-free animals which don't have any microbiota or if you've got antibiotics mediated depletion of the maternal gut microbiome, what are the effects on the brain and behavior uh, of the offspring specifically? And what, what you're seeing here on the left, um, this is a uh, next generation sequencing data showing that you've got all sorts of changes uh, in gene expression levels. And one of the genes that was specifically changed was Netrin G1. So it was lower in the, in the animals born to antibiotics treated dams. And when they looked at the brains of these animals, these are embryonic brains, they saw a significant decrease in the thalamocortical axon bundle called the internal capsule. And they, and of course, thalamocortical inter, um, like connections underlie a lot of sensory behaviors. And they specifically looked at uh, using von Frey uh, elements, uh, filaments, looking at PAW withdrawal threshold. And they saw, so in SPF, so this stands for specific pathogen free. That's just your normal mouse uh, that you can buy straight from the mouse vendors that so many of us use. So control mice, they've got a less than one PAW withdrawal threshold, but there's a significant increase in that PAW withdrawal threshold in both the offspring born to antibiotics and to germ-free dams. Furthermore, in this tape, curiosity tape pull test, um, they've got a latency to contact uh, this tape, uh, these, these offspring that were exposed to maternal microbial depletion or to, or to germ-free, born to germ-free animals. However, 
upon reintroduction of a, a spore-forming uh, bacteria dominated by the Clostridia, what they found was this was able to rescue um, the, the phenotypes that were shown here, and specifically getting even more detailed, they were able to isolate four microbially derived metabolites uh, that were sufficient to rescue uh, the loss of these uh, internal capsule axons and also rescue the behavior. So clearly the maternal gut microbiome was really important um, for normal neurodevelopment and neurodevelopmental outcomes. We were also building on work from Justin Sonnenberg's lab at Stanford, in which he's shown that these diet-induced extinctions among the gut microbiota can compound across generations. So when animals are normally, you know, this trip, just typical uh, vivarium diet, high fiber diet, there's no loss of diversity in the gut microbiome across generations, as shown in this nice cartoon. However, when the animals are, are fed a low fiber diet, you've got an overall reduction in diversity, not only in the generation that is first fed uh, that, that low fiber diet, but there's actually subsequent loss across um, additional generations, leading even to extinction um, in, in uh, generations three and four. And this is uh, well shown here from one of the um, figures from his paper. And so these are animals. This is initial gut microbiome composition, very rich, several taxa represented here. Uh, however, when the animals are put on a low fiber diet, um, they lose a lot of that microbial richness and it's not able to be rescued by being uh, having a high uh, fiber diet reintroduced. And you can see that this progresses across generations as they go from low fiber to low fiber to low fiber diet exposure. And actually, and uh, it make, that's, that's not seen in just normal mice across generations, right? And it required to increase that diversity back to near normal levels. It actually required a free fecal microbiota transplant. It could not be driven by diet alone. And so this brought me back to our model that we've got here. So we've got this high fat diet feeding of the dams in the parental generation leading to brain and behavioral dysfunction in the F1 animals, including some dysbiosis. However, and like we showed in that initial 2016 paper, the high fat diet does drive dysbiosis of the maternal gut microbiome. And we have evidence now and, and others have published similar findings that we've got an altered serum metabolome in high fat diet fed females, as well as immune dysregulation. So what this really creates is an adverse in utero environment that could be ultimately leading to the long-term brain and behavioral dysfunction we've observed in juveniles. Now, remember this principal coordinates analysis I showed you very early on in the talk and, and the fact that these fecal samples were isolated from six months old animals, right? So we've got this enduring dysbiosis of the gut microbiome. And so what we thought the, one of the best ways to test this importance of the maternal gut microbiome was actually to use these males' sisters. So we hypothesized that the female gut microbiome of these female F1 animals would be just as disrupted as that of their male uh, counterparts. And so, all right, so now we've got over here our F1 females, but they're in the maternal high fat diet lineage, right? So they have this history of exposure um, during gestation and lactation to high fat diet, even though they have been fed a regular diet ever since weaning. So we hypothesize that there would be this remnant dysbiosis of the maternal gut microbiome that could recapitulate the adverse in utero environment that was only exacerbated by the disruption and you know, the vertical transmission of this dysbiotic gut, gut microbiome resulting in brain and behavioral dysfunction in the F2 generation, even though grandma mouse was the only one that was consuming high fat diet. And so here's the setup. So in our parental generation, we've got our regular diet lineage, and now we've got our high fat diet lineage. So only grandma here is being fed a high fat diet. You've got regular diet exposure, uh, uh, exposure upon weaning of these maternal high fat diet F1 animals that are now being used to produce the F2 animals, uh, which we are uh, assaying the behavior of. All right, so consistent with our hypothesis, um, that we would see deficits in the F2 generation. That's exactly what we saw. And so we've got this three-chamber test for male sociability and preference for social novelty, and we've got clear deficits in the F2 animals. And we also see some mild deficits in our, our uh, F2 female animals too. However, consistent with the phenotypes in the F1 animals, several other mouse models for autism, as well as the odds uh, in, the, in the human population, the deficits that we see in our male maternal high fat diet lineage animals are much stronger than those that we see in our females. So we wanted to know, okay, so how, what is the gut, how is the gut microbiome 
both the F1 moms as well as the F2 offspring contributing to these phenotypes, these social phenotypes that we are seeing. And so we returned to our 16S analysis and we found it just like in the males, we saw a clear distinction in the composition of, of the gut microbiome of our F1 females that was dependent on the paternal diet exposure. However, we began to see a convergence of gut microbiome profiles in our F2 generation. They were kind of shifting toward each other and specifically away from the maternal high fat diet um, uh, composition. So if we look at this uh, in more specific numbers at the alpha diversity, so how many species are, are present, are detectable by sequencing, and what are their relative, what are their ratios to each other? What's the stoichiometry? Uh, we, we observed just like in our F1 males, we saw the significant reduction in overall diversity of the female F1 gut microbiome in our maternal high fat diet lineage. Uh, and, and specifically, we see a lot of uh, low abundance, loss of low abundance species, as well as some high abundance species, uh, no real changes in the stoichiometry of these uh, species to each other. And specifically, really interestingly, we saw a loss of a lot of short chain fatty acid producing species among those that were downregulated specifically in our F1 maternal high fat diet dams. Um, however, in the F2 generation, this was pretty much normalized. We see normalized or equal, uh, approximately equal levels of taxa, number of taxa that we identified in the F2 uh, maternal regular diet lineage versus maternal high fat diet lineage, and again, normal across the board. However, at the beta diversity level, which species were present um, in our F2 animals, there were still some differential taxa that we identified uh, by 16S sequencing. So to understand whether it was really this dysbiosis of the F1 gut microbiome versus the F2 gut microbiome that was driving these phenotypes, we returned to our germ-free mice. And so what we did was we performed fecal microbiota transplants um, from either F2 regular or high fat diet lineage animals and assayed the behavioral outcomes um, when they were uh, roughly five weeks later, around nine weeks old. And so what we saw was not only did the, the fecal microbiota transplant from our regular mice, but in this case, with the F2 transplant, we saw normal social behavior. So it was able to rescue these, like what I was telling you, these baseline deficits uh, in the germ-free animals. We saw that rescued uh, in our uh, F2 transplants. And so this really suggested to us that it's not the current dysbiosis of the gut microbiome that's necessarily driving those phenotypes, but we think it's really, this is it's pointing us back to the maternal gut microbiome during pregnancy that could be setting up this kind of adverse neurodevelopmental trajectory, ultimately driving the social behavior phenotypes that we observe both in F1 and F2. And so if that's true, and if we've got this normalization, partial restoration of this F2 gut microbiome, then we would expect normal behavior in F3, right? So let me walk you through this. So we've got regular diet being, being given to our F2 animals that do have a partially restored uh, maternal gut microbiome, right? So they've got uh, restored metabolism as well as a more normal immune function. And so that would drive a more normal in utero environment for healthy, normal neurodevelopment and, and, and resulting in more neurotypical social behavior. And that's exactly what we saw. Uh, so this is our male data. We saw that in the F3 animals in this maternal high fat diet, diet lineage, we had normal reciprocal social interaction. We had rescue uh, in our 3C sociability as well as preference for social novelty. And uh, furthermore, we also saw completely normal behavior in our, our 3C, uh, in our female animals in the F3 generation. Now, this doesn't prevent us from being interested in whether L. Rotary could actually rescue the deficits that we saw uh, in our F2 generation. And so we, we did our test where we put L. Rotary in the drinking water in these animals upon weaning, assayed behavior uh, four weeks later. And again, we consistent with our results in our F1 animals, uh, we saw a rescue of the social deficits in both the male and female um, animals. And, and specifically, and this is quite fascinating, we're still teasing this out, we actually saw a really dramatic increase in female sociability um, upon l rotary treatment. And so that's quite interesting. We're starting to see these you know, sex-dependent effects of, of probiotics uh, on, on behavior. 
And so we wanted to really look at what is a rotary doing in terms of my, the microbial community? How is it changing the ecology uh, of this community? And so we, we returned and did the 16S sequencing to get the information on which taxa are present and, and what, at what relative abundance to each other. And so we, we see this, there's some clear delineation now of the a rotary treated maternal regular diet line versus the high fat diet lineage. And if you recall, in these F2 animals, we had a completely normal alpha diversity, right? There weren't significant changes between the two groups um, in these alpha diversity metrics. But now, upon our rotary treatment, there are, right? There, you know, our rotary significantly actually decreased uh, the diversity of our L rotary rotary treated maternal high fat diet lineage uh, animals. And that's not totally unsurprising. A rotary produces an antimicrobial agent uh, called rotarin. And so I, I often think of a rotary as kind of a sheriff um, that can get the bad guys out of town, right? And so it's not all bad to reduce this diversity if you're getting rid of bad actors. And we also saw a uh, uh, hugely differential uh, taxa abundance between our L rotary treated regular versus maternal high fat diet lineage. And now seeing some differences in sex distribution shown by the different shapes here, uh, we decided to break this down um, by sex. And so when we looked at the males, really interesting, we saw some subtle changes in alpha diversity, right? Um, as you can see here, we saw 11 you know, differential taxa between the two groups, however, when we look at their sisters, right, and so they're born to the same mothers, they're in the same litter, they're in the same environment growing up, we see a much more profound effect on the composition of the female uh, gut microbiome. Really strong changes in alpha diversity metrics, uh, roughly 39, I think, uh, differential taxa between the groups. And so this, this is a really interesting idea, and it sets up this kind of vulnerability of not only the maternal high-fat diet lineage gut microbiome being more responsive, modulation by a probiotic, but specifically the female gut microbiome being highly responsive to modulation um, by, by a probiotic. And so we're excited about this idea, right? Because clearly if, if we've got the maternal gut microbiome is really important for normal, healthy uh, neurodevelopment of the offspring, uh, then maybe we could intervene at the level of the maternal gut microbiome during pregnancy. And so what we're working on now, and we have a, a paper in preparation that I'm super excited about, is that we've, uh, we've got therapeutic targeting of the maternal gut microbiome, and could this reduce risk for social dysfunction in, in mouse models for uh, autism and other uh, disorders of social dysfunction? And could this even work in humans? And so that's where we, we're beginning to ask this. We've developed a probiotic uh, cocktail formulation in the lab uh, that's, that we're seeing efficacy with. And so I'm super excited uh, to follow up with this. And, and uh, please keep uh, uh, look, look for our uh, future publication on this. I'm really excited about it. So to kind of to wrap up here, um, this is uh, Liverpool uh, Mill Road Maternity Hospital. That's a picture from uh, the early uh, 1960s. And uh, Liverpool uh, was the first place where uh, folic acid supplementation was tried as a dietary supplementation to reduce the risk for neural tube defects. And so Liverpool, um, it was there was an indigent population there where maternal nutrition wasn't great. They were seeing high rates of uh, neural tube and other uh, developmental defects in the children that were being born there. And the findings that, that, that folic acid was so um, effective at reducing nearly 100% of these neural tube, tube disorders, now folic acid supplementation is, is required in, I think, 86 to 87 countries worldwide and has really made a huge advance in reducing uh, these neural tube defects, among other uh, fetal malformations. And so where we were in 1965 with prenatal vitamins and reducing frequency of fetal malformations, in 2023, could we be actually at a place where we could begin to realize the potential of prenatal probiotics for reducing risk for neurodevelopmental disorders. And this is what Liverpool Women's uh, looks like today. So with that, I'd like to thank um, all of the great members of my lab, especially Ian uh, Boulding, Lisa Matz, uh, Claudia Diesu, and uh, Robert Fultz, who were integral to producing uh, this work. We've got collaborators at Baylor College of Medicine, Christy and, and Joe. Of course, I, I did my postdoctoral work from which the first half of the talk um, was based with Mauro Costamadioli, who was at BCM, now he's with Altus Labs. And I have several other great collaborators that we worked with. Uh, I've got fantastic support, um, not only from the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation and the Scott Gentle Foundation, but also from our Gulf Center 
Gulf Coast Center for Precision Environmental Health. I've had excellent uh, pilot support from UTMB and the John S. Dunn Foundation, and, and now we're funded through the National Institute for Child Health and Human Development. So thank you so much for the opportunity to speak about our work today. Shelley, thank you for the work you're doing and, and for an outstanding presentation. A lot of information in there um, and very promising in terms of the potential. Um, um, at this point in time, are there recommendations that you can make to women who may be pregnant or may be thinking about becoming pregnant soon? Yeah, that's a, that's a million dollar question. It's a really good one. So um, just to caveat that, I am a PhD that primarily works with mice. And so I definitely re recommend it to my mice. It seems to have good effects. However, um, okay. for women, so I, I think that really increasing that diversity of the gut microbiome uh, based on uh, getting a lot of um, that variety in diet, especially um, poly, you know, uh, complex polysaccharides uh, from dietary fiber is going to produce a lot of these really important short chain fatty acid uh, through fermentation of the gut microbiota, these short chain fatty acids that are so important um, to regulating overall uh, neurodevelopmental health and just development in general. And so I think that number one, diversity of diet. Number two, yes, there, there are certainly several probiotics uh, that are out there that are available. I don't think that any has been rigorously tested enough to say that, oh, this is the one that will really help, right? Um, and I'm definitely not an MD. However, I think that we are on the precipice of being able to realize that in the next hopefully five to 10 years, and then and, and hopefully I'll have a, a great recommendation for you down the road. Um, again, I just, I don't know that we have the delivery mechanism quite figured out. And I don't think that we've optimized necessarily, you know, the, the particular cocktails or the, you know, the species that would really be optimal. And again, I think it, you know, the way we think about it is just like maybe not every woman necessarily would need like fol folic acid supplementation depending on dietary levels, et cetera. Like kind of no matter where mom's gut microbiome starts at, um, what we're hoping to develop is like a, a formulation probiotic cocktail that could just help really promote um, this healthy neurodevelopment, healthy, healthy development um, in general. And so I hope that we'll be able to get there uh, in the next you know five to 10 years. Uh, so I certainly think it's on the horizon. Well, I, th I think what you're saying is, is very much on target in terms of probably most many women, uh, you know, their diet is, is, is fine, but you want to be able to make sure everybody gets what yeah. they need. And exactly. And it's just, you know, probiotics are, you know, many of them are generally regarded as safe and it's, they're just so cost effective. Um, it's just another thing that could potentially, you know, once we've really got this figured out, be added into that prenatal regimen, right? Absolutely. And we received a, a number of questions uh, about um, how about in young children that mm -hmm. may uh, be demonstrating uh, the types of symptoms that you described, um, what potentially, and I understand we're not yet there, but it, it certainly any suggestions, any ideas about what could be done in terms of their diet? that might be helpful. Yeah, sure. I, I, again, I think that, you know, uh, hopefully the you know, fruits and vegetables and, you know, oatmeal, et cetera, all of these things that are going to con contain these, you know, complex polysaccharides that can be broken down by these, you know, in, by fermentation and producing short chain fatty acids and other helpful metabolites that would help dampen, uh, you know, intestinal inflammation, uh, I think would be, be super helpful. Dietary fiber, uh, right, is, is critical for that. And so if we can dampen inflammation there, you know, so one of these, you know, the one of the first, uh, uh, findings that really drove this idea that this gut-brain connection, especially that in its relevance uh, to behavioral disorders, is that a, a lot of like parent report. I think Pat Levitt's uh, group uh, from USC published on that this in the early you know 2013-2015. Um, a lot of this parent report on behavioral episodes is that it often the most extreme behavioral episodes coincided with gastrointestinal distress, right? And so I think the idea of um, dampening inflammation. Uh, with these kind of immunomodulatory species or kind of like a, high, a more high fiber diet um, will go a long way um, in not only helping with behavioral episodes, but hopefully also managing some of that gastrointestinal distress that can so often go along with it as a comorbidity. Uh, very, very helpful. And I'm wondering if your work may ultimately relate to other 
conditions such as schizophrenia. Um, yes. And if you could comment on yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Absolutely, we haven't been using any models for schizophrenia yet, but certainly, especially you know, with the relevance of that dopaminergic reward um, pathway, we're really looking into in my lab how the gut microbiome modulates these mo these circuits that are underlying motivated behaviors, right? And that's going to be relevant to a lot of these neuropsychiatric diseases in which you see um, these uh, strong phenotypes driving social dysfunction, driving um, just kind of difficulty you know, with success and being able to you know focus and um, kind of carry out uh, uh, essential life functions and so I think it certainly can be relevant there a lot of what we're working on is also relevant to metabolic disorders right and so we hope to be expanding uh, in, in coming years as the lab continues to grow and um, others that are contributing to this field are making such amazing advances so we're really excited and, um, and uh, optimistic about what the future is going to bring here Looking at the future, we, when we have you back to speak again in a few years from now, mm -hmm. what do you think you're going to be able to tell us as an update? Well, I, I, I think that we will kind of dive deeper into the mechanism and to how these uh, probiotics that do rescue behavior, not only when directly given to our adolescent mice, but also through you know, modulation of the maternal gut microbiome and, and its remodeling during pregnancy. I think that we're gonna have a lot more mechanistic insight and I'm excited to deliver that. And I'm really hoping that we can move this into humans uh, within that, that time frame that you suggested. Wonderful. Shelly, I, I'm very excited about the work you're doing and appreciate all that you are doing um, and uh, appreciate the time that you spent um, for this presentation. So thank you so very, very much. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for the invitation. Yes. Uh, I also want to thank everybody who joined us today. And I'd ask people to please consider making a donation to BBRF today. 100% of every dollar donated for research is invested in our research grants. We're able to do this because our operating expenses are covered by separate foundation grants. This means that when you donate a dollar for research, that dollar goes directly to the scientists. To make a gift, please visit the website bbrfoundation.org or call us directly at 1-800-829-8289. This webinar has been recorded. If you've missed any portion of the presentation or would like to share it with friends and family, please visit the events and webinar page on our website. And please join us again next month on March 14th at 2 p.m. Eastern time when Dr. Rachel Ross, assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry, Neuroscience and Medicine at Albert Einstein College of Medicine will present neuroscience of stress and metabolism. Thank you. And remember, together, we can dramatically improve the lives of those living with mental illness and enable more people to live full, happy, and productive lives. Thank you. <laughs>